Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 82, Server Monitoring. How you doing, Jay? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. I uh, checked my server monitoring and everything was up. And we still managed to start a few minutes late because I forgot to monitor how much water was in my cup before I started. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, it's always those details. But yeah. this is a topic that we were both shocked we haven't covered. Me and Jay were scratching our heads when we said, We've covered server monitoring. Certainly we have. And we yeah. searched for that term and could not find it. So we said, you know, we should because there's a lot of different fun tools to talk about. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, if you're looking for a place to host that server monitoring, our sponsor of the show today is Linode. And it's a good place to host some of these monitoring tools for monitoring things externally. Now, this is a self-hosted show. So yes, we'd like to talk about things you self-host, but hey, sometimes you got to put those things in the cloud and Linode, the sponsor of the show, is a great cloud to put them in. So we all know the cloud is someone else's computer, so why not make it Linode's computers that you're using for all that stuff? <laughs> uh, definitely a great service. We thank them for being a sponsor of the show. We got an offer code of the Home Lab Show, and it's also linked in the description down below if you'd like to get started with them. And let's jump into our monitoring topic. Yep, let's dive right in. Dive right in. What's the first one we're going to talk about? Because we have a few. Yeah, we have more than a few. And some of these are more full featured than others. And I, I do want to acknowledge that there's a ginormous number of these out there. So I'm not going to even pretend like I've tried them all. Right. Um, yeah. So for me, I use Nagios. I know a certain subset of the audience is like, you still use Nagios? Because there's that um, mentality that Nagios is old. You got to move off of it, which I can understand why people feel that way. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with it other than the fact that it literally looks like a GeoCities website from 1997. And I don't think anybody will argue with me on that when they see the inter interface of Nagios. But um, <laughs> it's a classic, right? I mean, it um, it monitors whatever uh, you want to monitor for the most part. You can write scripts to monitor the things that it doesn't by default. It's not something I would recommend people start with because I feel like there's a lot better solutions that are easier to get started nowadays, but it's something that I set up like so many years ago and it works. So I just keep maintaining it. But Nagios is um, fairly standard in the industry. You can self-host, obviously. Um, I don't. I think I've only met one person that paid for the Nagios hosted version in my entire career. Just that one person. So, <laughs> basically, you could download it, install it. There's setup guides out there, but again, I'm not going to pretend like it's the easiest, most straightforward installation you'll, you'll ever perform. Yeah. So, um, a couple other things about it. I mean, the default monitors. I mean, Nagios is kind of like the Swiss Army knife. So. It, it'll monitor CPU swap, uh, SSH processes, whether or not they're running. So basically all of the key things that you might want it to monitor, it basically does that out of the box. And I think the thing I like about it the most, and I also think others do this as well, you could, you could basically write any script and then the exit code is going to then determine whether or not the check was a success or failure. So um, if you're good at writing scripts, you could basically extend it and uh, push it even further. Yeah, in we're starting out the high end side of it because yep. Nagios, I, I'll admit, I think there's quite a few network services that it can tie into as well. If I'm not mistaken, even yeah. PFSense has a Nagios uh, plugin. Are you using that or? I am. Yep, okay. I, I absolutely am. So it's monitoring <clears throat> everything. And I think um, I probably should have started with what to monitor because I think that was probably a better place to start because I oh. think that's also a place where there's some confusion. Um, for example, if a server is, I don't know, 75% busy most of the time or 60% or whatever, a lot of people might think, well, what's wrong with the server? The CPU is always kind of high. And I think, well, it's doing work. You have a server and you have it to perform some sort of job or some sort of purpose for existing. But then again, when the CPU gets up to 100 and then you have your load average that gets a lot higher, it's time to step in. So monitoring CPU, obviously, is something to monitor as well. Um, there's also the argument between memory and swap. If you have swap on your systems, then some people will just monitor swap because they figure, well, when memory is empty, it starts hitting up swap, but I'm a fan of you know monitoring memory beforehand. I think there's a certain art to finding out what to monitor, but basically the way I look at it, anything that you want to have running should be monitored, whether it's a process, an entire server, something that you want to be informed of. On my end, I'm monitoring 
the access points, the switches, PF sense, which, which is how you reminded me to, to mention that. And I basically know the internet is down before anyone else because um, I have, I still have a wired connection between everything in the outside world. So if an access point drops, I already know about it and I get the alert on my phone. So finding out what to monitor is always the first thing, but then Nagios, yeah, just like you mentioned, that is gonna be more full featured. It just monitors everything but the kitchen sink and it might be overkill for some people. Yeah, and let's make a couple of things clear. There's yep. monitoring, such as Nagios. There's monitoring and metrics, which is something Nagios will do as well. So there's yep. some of the tools we're going to talk about are just monitoring, like status. Is it up versus diving a little deeper? And then there's monitoring metrics and maybe an action that needs to occur. And an action can be more than just a uh, notice that something's down. So Nagios goes into the advanced. So we're starting on the advanced side of it because Jay has some cool scripts that will do... <clears throat> Um, the yep. ability to restart a service, stop something, uh, make an action happen based on a Nagios result. So I think that's a uh, yep. you know, important distinction that Nagios has. It's one of the reasons it's more complicated to set up is because it has a lot more features. Yeah. I would be the same for Zabbix, which is on the other side of it. Um, it's a little further down the alphabet, but it's one of them that I've been using <laughs> for a little while. Yeah, I, I think Zabbix is great, open source, um, fully functional. I've done a video on it, but unfortunately, I haven't had time to do a new video. Uh, so my video has a more dated looking dashboard. They have updated the dashboard. Z Zabbix is one of those, um, it, it's kind of easy to get started but it's going to take you a whole lot longer to get good at type of thing right and zabbix is nice because uh, i generally we're talking a lot about linux servers on here zabbix goes much deeper zabbix will monitor do the metrics do the actions even has an entire troubleshooting system inside of it where you can say hey who who resolved this like as a ticket and have an action on there and monitors windows servers as well so you can integrate this and this is all agent based now you can use uh, some S uh, snmp features with zabbix but they're not going to be as rich as if you uh, did it with the zabbix agent that being said they do have zabbix agents for a lot of different platforms not just pf sense but many of them and as i stated with windows you can even load zabbix right into they have a normally compiled binary for windows there's no special weird way you got to set it up and start gathering metrics on windows servers it's really slick because over time and having used Zabbix for years, uh, it's kind of cool to see just the history of all the data and transfers and bandwidth uh, that I'm getting like out of PF Sense. There's also a large, rich community for Zabbix of templates for all kinds of different things, which is important. That way, if you go, hey, I have this uh, Cisco switch here. I wonder if Zabbix has a template. Well, for a lot of the big brand name equipment, it does. Uh, Zabbix also scales very well. There's a video you can find of a large IT provider that manages, I want to say they were in the 100,000 roughly devices managed in the Zabbix instance. Um, it, it has the ability to load balance and cluster. So it's got some abilities to scale, but it can be done. It can scale to some pretty impressive numbers to monitor large amounts of infrastructure. So uh, yeah. it's definitely on the higher side of it, um, but definitely um, a, a really cool tool, just like Nagios. I would see nine well, Zabbix yeah. compete with each other in a way. They're in that same similar category. Yeah, I, I um I've used both. So I've always used Nagios in my home lab, but I, I worked at a job where Zabbix was used quite heavily. Actually, a couple of jobs now. And I have to say overall, I think I might like Zabbix better. On my end, I mean I'm I'm so into Nagios, it'd just be time consuming to replace it and it works just fine. So yeah. why replace it? But um I'm not sure how far you can extend Zabbix. Nagios, I feel like, is going to be on a higher level of complexity, which is basically what we just said. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. So at one job I worked at where we used Nagios, I actually worked with another person. We created a Python script with an API call. It was able to log into the company's AWS account, do an inventory of what instances were there, apply a host template, to each and every single one and dynamically like Nagios would grow and expand to match whatever we had, which is not how it works. Like everyone that um, uses Nagios, they know that it's a little tedious. You have to have a host config file, a text file per server. 
And it's not hard because you can just copy the, an existing one and, and just change the values. It's pretty easy to do, but it's still a little, a lot more complex. But the fact that I was able to do that, I'm sure Zabbix probably has plugins for AWS that makes it a lot easier than it is in Nagios. So I think when you compare the two together, um, there's no right or wrong answer. Whatever one um, has the feature set that you're looking for is probably the best one to go with. Yeah, both of them, both of them are good. And kind of a mention, uh, I think he's got a couple write-ups on it. Hostify, my friend Riley, who owns that company, he built his infrastructure out to manage his thousands of servers and create a self-healing system because he mm -hmm. uh, hosts Unify controllers. And anytime there's a, a problem with any of the Mongo instances, because they use MongoDB in the back end, he's actually got Zabbix uh, monitoring it, letting them know what's going on and restarting or stopping services or making modifications kind of as needed. So we, there are some great examples out there that people have for uh, good use cases for you know scaled installs of uh, Zabbix. So before we go any further, I want to you know, talk about a side subject that's directly related. And, and someone uh, brought this up, uh, Learn Blue Iris brought it up in our chat room, asking if I use SMS. And the answer is no, I have never used SMS. I mean, I think I've used it for a week. I did configure it and set it up just to see how you do that. But I think I just um, got to a point where I didn't like that for whatever reason, I don't remember why. But we do, you do kind of need a way of getting alerts to whatever device you want to receive those alerts on. Because the whole point of a monitoring system is to let you know when there's a yes. problem. But how does it let you know? How do you get that notification? And early on, I had uh, set up like email alerts via Nagios. I had an email server. Bad idea. I'm not doing that again. Um, <laughs> but it would allow me to get the alerts via email. But then the problem becomes emails kind of get lost in all the other emails in my inbox that I have yet to answer, which is not a good place for your alerts to be, in my opinion. Um, so I use a system or a service called Pushover. It's a paid service, so I know it's not going to be like um, the top of anyone's list, so to speak, but it's effective. It's an app on your phone. You have a, a um, kind of like a hash key or a um, API key almost, and you just basically have all of your services reach out to it, whether it's Nagios, Ansible in my case, they all go to this app. And you can snooze if you don't care for an hour, like you're just trying to have dinner and you want the alerts to leave you alone for an hour or something like that. But it's very easy to set up and very flexible. You don't have to maintain an email server. In that case, you don't have to buy like SMTP access from a third party. Um, it's still paid, just getting that out there. I forgot how much it was, it's not much money. But if you have no, no other solution, pushover is something to consider. But then again, if there's a self-hosted option that does the same thing, then um, that's probably also worth considering. But you need a mechanism through which to get those alerts when something goes wrong. Yeah, and I'm partial to, because uh, we use it at work, and a lot of times the reality of using these is pushing them into Slack messages. Uh, yeah. But a combination of Slack or email is usually adequate for what I want to do. Um, but if, you know, if home lab people in... You're not going to find anything for free. Just own it out there. But SMS is going to be a popular option because a lot of people want to push right to their phone because they right. have an overwhelming number of Slack messages and emails. So they're like, that that particular pipeline is full of noise. Please send it to this lesser used pipeline, which I don't know if it's lesser used because I, I get it. Well, Google does a good job of filtering it, but I still get a decent amount of text spam. So <laughs> yeah, it depends on the Slack account because a lot of them that I've been on, and I kind of avoid Slack for this reason because it's, it's just like, notification overkill because you know you can mute the notifications in different rooms that aren't something you're really actively following but then he, then anytime anyone mentions at here um you're going to get the alert and then just to find out it's a bunch of memes or something so i really like pushover being completely separate from anything else it's a dedicated app just for alerts it doesn't it doesn't do your taxes it's not going to help with your spreadsheet skills it's literally just that one thing it does that one thing only so it's almost like the Unix philosophy, do one thing and do one thing well. So you can yeah. have this dedicated app that is just there for that reason. So when you see an alert from that app, there's nothing else it can be other than an alert. That's the only thing that it does. You don't have to separate um, you know, the politician spam during an election that goes into your SMS messages, for example. And uh, you know, we all get a lot of those and I'm glad that's over. So, um, but it's good to have it in a dedicated app in my opinion, when you can. Yeah, I see people mentioning Discord and Telegram. I mean. Yep. The downside can be, 
with any of these slack being that it's more business oriented i'm going to say there's extremely few slack outages um discord oddly i don't use it for much uh, but i don't recall a lot of discord outages my i i use it to talk mm. to my son and a few of my youtube friends but i can't think of too many outages um with discord yeah. uh telegram I, it's very third party i've never been a huge fan of telegram uh, but i know a lot of people seem to like it so it, it comes down to what you want to use but just it's food for thought to think that now that you the more services you have to rely on or the more complicated those external services are could be a pipelining problem to get the data to you just something to consider on there there's not there's not an easy answer for that one it's really where is your attention going to be drawn to is where you want that to be notified <laughs> so what yep. works for you is what that comes down to in your workflow Another tool that I want to bring up, and uh, someone mentioned this in the chat room, and that person reminded me, I can't find the message now, but um, smoke ping is something that I also use in addition to Nagios, which is going to measure network latency. As long as you make it a point to always add new network hosts to your smoke ping configuration, I mean, if you keep forgetting to add things, it's not going to be accurate. But if anytime you have um, some latency in your network, you could pretty much track it down right to the device. Now, granted, I could do that in PF Sense too with some of the meters in there, but it's not at the level that Smoke Ping is in. Now, honestly, I really don't like the um, UI theme in Smoke Ping because I think the graphs are a little hard to read. I mean, it's mm, not that yeah. hard. It's just they they don't look all that great, and there's not a lot of themes out there that are available for you know putting a UI theme or a CSS theme around it. But if you just let that slide, it basically just does that one thing. Again, if you just want to see network latency, if you get a message from your alerting system that something is taking too long to load, for example, which is another thing you can monitor, then you can go into smoke ping and find out, um, is it like the network VLAN that, that device is on is being saturated by something? Is that device itself the only thing? And you can kind of narrow it down that way. So sometimes having a mix of tools is a really good idea because it can help you hone in on things that your monitoring solution itself may not do like the best job. Like Nagios has meters and graphs too, but it's still not going to be on the same level that uh, smoke ping might show you the details. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the next one, should we talk about uptime robot? Yeah. So we talked about this um, off camera a bit because I was kind of in a hurry and, and I hate it when this happens when I make decisions in a hurry because you know, you know content <laughs> schedules and things like that. So I was using status cake and I thought it was really expensive, but before I get into that, what's the point here? So there's a, a term where you have to watch the watcher. You know, if you're yeah. if you don't get an alert on your phone or your Slack channel, whatever it happens to be in a long time, you're probably thinking, man, my home lab is awesome. There's not a single server that's down. Everything is up. Everything is great, which might be true, but it also might not be if you're not paying attention to whether or not your monitoring server went down. If that goes down, then yeah, you're going to think everything is fine when it's not. So I like to have something on the outside that, that does simple uptime monitoring. Basically, is your website online? Is learnlinux.tv online? That kind of thing. Is the home lab show online? And yeah, monitoring all of that in Nagios too, but what if Nagios goes down? I want something else to kind of watch it for me. And at first I was using Status Cake just out of habit. I used to use that at work. It's super expensive. I'm not going to recommend that to anyone because that's kind of <laughs> why I switched away from it because I had more things to monitor and then to, to move up a level in the paid plan, It I just felt like the price was like astronomical for um, such a small operation. I'm not like Microsoft. I don't have like a zillion servers. I just have the servers I need, a, a dozen or so. But to move up to that level is a lot more money. So I looked up an alternative and Uptime Robot was highly rated. And I, I do have a paid plan. It is cheaper than Status Cake. I don't remember by how much, but I, I did save some money by switching to it. But then when we talked last night, I learned that there's Uptime Kuma. That's a thing that exists apparently that I did yeah. not know about when I um, paid for my year plan for Uptime Robot. So I, I do like Uptime Robot it, and it does what it says it does. I'll just keep using it. But when the subscription is over in July, then maybe I'll look into Uptime Kuma. Yeah, now Uptime Kuma... Um, I just had a video I posted, and I posted this on Twitter as well, uh, talking about using Uptime Kuma, and it doesn't have a really high system requirement. Um, I took an old Raspberry Pi 3, 3D printed a case, do the, just a short video up on YouTube and asking if people wanted a more in-depth video, but Uptime Kuma is wonderful. And the inspiration for Uptime Kuma and why it looks so much like Uptime Robot, which a lot of people are familiar with, 
is literally they the developer said hey i want to try to make something that looks like uptime robot but free now the the integrations it has are interesting because it doesn't just do ping monitoring. It can do monitoring via TCP ports, look for specific statuses. So you can actually say, hey, I want to make sure that this particular status exists when I pull this HTTP or HTTPS or any particular TCP port. So there's a lot of fine tuning to monitor things more than just ping. They can give you the uptime status of those things. It can create public facing dashboards. So people can just go jump in and look right at the dashboard of the thing they want to see. And, you know, for a demo, I set up all the different internal production servers and our lab servers all in a one single interface. So the staff internally can just see the entire list. Now, the way they notify you in it is fascinating to me because I can't believe how long the list is. The things we mentioned like SMS and Telegram, they also have Signal. They also have Slack. They also have just a really wide range of things. They also have Cloudflare tunneling built in. So if you want this to be public facing, you can actually just throw your Cloudflare tunnel token in there. And I did a video the other day, you can find on my channel about how Cloudflare tunnels work. And the integrations for Uptime Kuma is just like wild. Like how much you can do with it is... Uh, pretty interesting yeah I, i'm hearing a lot or hearing i'm seeing a lot of uh text in our chat room here about uptime kuma so it seems to be well loved so i really like seeing that it, it's kind of like there's no question on what i'm going to try if that many people in our audience are all about it then there must be something to it so i definitely plan on checking that out i just don't know when but it sounds great from what i'm hearing right so i definitely um you know that that's one of the easy ones to get set up now now this is not metrics it may have some stats like, hey, it pings this many milliseconds, et cetera, but it's, <clears throat> but it's really not a metrics gathering system. It's not going to be as extensive what we mentioned with Nagios. It's not going to be as extensive as Zabbix in terms of having, you know, processor usage because there's no agent you're installing on here. You're just taking it from its position, wherever you put it inside, outside your network. You're giving it a list of things to talk to and give you the status of whether or not those things are talking and send you a notice is an option if that thing is down. So it's really, yep. really simplistic. It makes it one of the easier things to get going. It's, as I said, though, not where you're going to get that in-depth data. You're not going to go, hey, this the server's still pinging. Yeah, but the load average on it's so high, it's not useful. So up and working yep. are not necessarily the same things. That's why the more complicated things for metrics management come in. Right. Uh, another one quick one I want to bring up, and I brought this up like probably 15,000 times throughout the series so far, but I think it's fitting. So I'll just sneak in one more. Um, healthchecks.io. And this is very, very specific. And it's it's not necessarily monitoring. It kind of is. So if you have a cron job or multiple cron jobs, how do you know that those ran? You could absolutely set up a script that's going to email you or hook into whatever your system let, to let you know. But healthchecks.io is really cool because it gives you like a hash key that you add to the end of your cron job. Well, you could add it at the beginning if you want, but that'd be silly because... You want this to run at the end of the job. And what it does is it resets a counter. So if you set, um, I don't know, let's just say seven days, you have to get a ping to this um, URL in um, within seven days. And if that doesn't happen, it'll email you. So at the end of the script, you basically just have it, um, you know, reach out to that URL and as the last step, and it'll reset that counter. But if the counter doesn't reset, that means that the cron job did not run. So in that case, you know, you need to go in there and look at that. So if you have cron jobs that you need to make sure have run, then there's a service for that. Healthchecks.io is fantastic. And there's probably other use cases for it as well. I personally use it to make sure that my Ansible jobs run because I use Ansible pull, which is kind of like the inverse of the Ansible model where it runs local host on the server rather than the server reaching out to other servers. But the consequence of that is, did it run? It's running by cron. I don't know. So healthchecks.io, I added that to my um, provision script and it needs to run within seven days. If it doesn't, it gives me an alert. Yeah, that's, that's a really easy service to use. Now, yep. we, we want to probably address the elephant in the room here. Well, the complicated elephant in the room, because we, me and Jay talked about this uh, last night during a conversation. It's using the whole Prometheus, Grafani, and Loki. Yeah. Um, Techno Tim, he's an easy example of someone who really likes that. And we have another friend, Phil. Um, he's not a YouTuber, but he also really likes it. The two things those people have in common, they do very complicated developer things. And it yeah. seems like people who do complicated developer things really love all the cool stuff you can do with Grafana. 
I have not played with Grafana in a while. Uh, and Jay has had some business experience with it as well. The yeah. problem I've always run into is the layers of complexity. Don't get me wrong. Once you get it set up, it's beautiful. It looks pretty. I'll, I'll give it to them in terms of their ability to collect all the metrics and display them in a great way. Awesome. The downside is when someone's like, oh, it's easy. And then I watch them just spill script out of, you know, how they wrote it. I'm like, oh, it's not really that I know of. And correct me if I'm misinformed on a lot of this. Uh, but last time I looked at it, it was a little bit harder to set up than any of the ones we mentioned. And I've set up Zabbix. He set up Nagios. We still found Grafana uh, still a bit more complex to kind of get tuned and going and doing. So I think that was the yeah. Uh, challenges we've seen with them is this, and I, I imagine it's become more popular. Documentation is getting better, but I didn't find the best documentation when I looked. Grant, it's probably been about a year or two. I think this is an example of the home lab community actually improving the environment for everybody. Like, like we're actually heroes at this because when I first set up Grafana, um, it was actually me and an employee of mine when I back when I was um, working at a place other than my main company here. Um, you know, when I went solo. And we found that there was just no documentation at the time. And um, my colleague literally engaged with the person that was in the process of writing a book just to get the process or project done faster by collaborating because there just wasn't any information. But nowadays, I feel like with the home lab movement, we're creating documentation, we're making videos, and there's probably a lot more out there right, right now about it. But what I would say, though, is I feel like Grafana is a better fit for an MSP that is hosting clients and CTOs from those businesses that are being hosted need the graphs to show their upper management that everything is running. And I know I'm I'm kind of oversimplifying this and I'm not saying home lab people don't have a use for this. We absolutely do. There's a presence, but I feel like there's another solution, which I think you're probably going to mention after this, yes. that um, I think is a better fit for home lab people. Because again, although Grafana is absolutely a great choice and very effective for home lab people, I do think it's overkill. And I do think it's a better um, solution for MSPs and the developers and DevOps people within that that are trying to show CTOs that their server is running fine. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I'll mention for swinging it over to the opposite of Grafana in terms of simplicity, but still has really, really pretty metric presentation for monitoring, and that's net data. Net data, I've loved this project for a long time, and it just keeps getting better. Every time I look at it, and I've talked to the developers there, they're just doing cool things. And the latest iterations of it with the way they do the consolidated dashboard, the way they do the install, excuse me, the way they do the installer. I mean, they've covered everything from Docker to managing ZFS, managing Redis, managing MongoDB. Like it gives you metrics on everything it finds. And as far as setup goes, it's extremely automated. All the different, what are kind of called plugins, I guess, if you will, that you run on it, you don't have to do any configuring of them. So that's why I say kind of call plugins. When you set up net data, it figures out all the things that it has access to on that particular system you set it up on and just automatically loads all those different modules, gives you really, really good insights. And the insights are really kind of interesting because when you start taking all of your servers and grouping them together and then tie them to like the net data dashboard, you can actually grab a time slice of a specific time when something happened and then pivot that across all the different servers. And their, their kickstart install script, just like a one liner. The the only prerequisite, and I this is when you learn when you do YouTube demo videos because you usually end up with hosts with the same name. Turns out if you have the host and you clone a host and you don't give it a new host name, but when you clone it, uh, net data won't install and you'll scratch your head for a minute. But now they have a fail error that you can find because it says, hey, this ID is not unique. <laughs> so uh, outside of that, not a, not a problem anyone's likely to run into, but it's not a big deal. You just change the host name of that system to, you know, add a one after it. So simple things like that. And then you can get in there, but uh, I can't believe how easy they've done it. And that's one of those things when I look at any project, if the project is so easy to set up, so easy to get running, that tells me how good the team on the back end is. If you have right. a good team developing a product, it's going to be easy to set up, easy to use, easy to update, and easy to get all of your data out of. That is definitely a definition that the net data people have done. Uh, it's one of the reasons it's just, I like it. It's, I do enough complicated things. I don't need to spend, and don't get me wrong, I've watched some videos on Grafana and said, that looks really cool. But 
I looked at net data and go, this also looks really cool. And it was a one liner <laughs> to get it going. <laughs> yeah, that's something I plan on trying soon when I get a chance. It, it definitely sounds pretty good. I, I have seen it in action, so I, I do understand it, it. It does look pretty cool. Yeah, that's um the, the team keeps adding more and more things to it, and it's fully open source. Now, granted, they do have a business model behind it. They're doing so they will have an alerting that goes up to their dashboard. Their dashboard is free, but there are enhancements you can do to the dashboard for long-term data storage, et cetera, that are upsells that there's options for. So there's a business model behind it, but you don't have to use their dashboard. It's not required to get it going. You can monitor individual servers. You can just load it. It. Uh, I think it's port 19999. Don't quote me on that, but it's in a documentation. You can just go to that port on any server on your network that you've loaded it on. It does not have to go out to anything to do any of the monitoring. It can all be done. You can then start looking at it from that internal uh, point of view. It's just kind of cool when you throw it on there for the, uh, what do you call that for the dashboard? Um, but even internally, it does offer one of the new things they added this year is what prompted me to do a new video on it was anomaly detection. Now, I'm not mm. good at tuning that yet because they're still building the documentation for it, but it looks for your baseline average of that server over time and says, hey, the server did a thing and then has some monitoring slash notices it can give you so you can focus on any anomalies and then try and figure out what happened uh, when that anomaly occurred. So it, it's, yep. it's just kind of a neat way to unravel all those resources and how they're being used on your servers. Yeah, that sounds like a great way to do it. All right, what was the next one that we have? I think that was the main ones we had on the list here. I see yeah. a few people ask about Libre NMS um, and Observium. I've not really used those ones. Libre MS, um, much like Nagios, I, I, unless they've updated something recently, always had an old and ugly kind of looking interface. And things that aren't agent based that try to reach out and monitor servers are never going to be as good as something like Zavix or Nagios that has an agent that can actually gather a lot more of the data. I mean, if you like them and they work for your use case, I don't see any reason not to use them. They just right. weren't a fit when I looked at things for the use cases we were doing for monitoring things. Yeah, another person asked about UPS monitoring. Um, Nut is a popular solution yep. for that. And actually, I'm I'm kind of boring in this regard because I don't use anything. I, I actually have the plugin for um, PFSense, the APC plugin mm -hmm. that it uh, comes with yeah. or is available out of the box. You can install the plugin. And it just alerts my phone if the power is out. And since I have a um, VPN client installed on my laptop, wherever I may be, and also on my phone, then I don't really care so much about NUT. I know that's the better way to do it. It you absolutely should do it that way. And I'm not making a case for over simple, you know, simplifying things here. But my mindset was if I get an alert on my phone that my power's out, I always have a VPN client that's within reach. I can just log in and shut things down myself. Granted, that's a lot of work because there's a lot of things to shut down, but uh thankfully power outages here are extremely, extremely rare, which is the polar opposite of how it used to be where I would have uh, several power outages a month. But here I, I think it's happened twice since I moved out this way. So I probably should set up a uh, nut on my end. I just haven't had a chance to do it. But then the counter argument is how infrequent it is and the fact that I can just SSH in and shut things down. But um, if you have the time to set up something like nut, um, I've heard some great things about it and it comes highly recommended by quite a few people. Yeah, and Techno Tim has a deep dive video on that. So if you type in Techno Tim Nut, oddly that's going to give you the video you want. <laughs> and he's got like an hour long video on all the details of setting up uh, Nut. I, I I wish I had a better name, but um, it doesn't. So <laughs> it, oh, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Yep, sometimes you feel like <laughs> a nut, sometimes you don't. So <laughs> the uh, but yeah, it is the de facto standard. You'll actually find there, there's actually a few interesting things you can do with the one built into PF Sense as well. Uh, you can actually plug it in to some of them, the USBs, and have if I'm not mistaken, PF Sense has the ability to act as a nut server to send the shutdown on there. Yeah. But anything that you'll yeah. find when it comes to UPS, I don't even think outside of vendor proprietary software. Nut is the, the only one I'm aware of uh, that has the broad range of support of so many different UPS vendors. And mm -hmm. you can use Nut as a server to then send out the signal to the other servers to tell them to do actions. So it's definitely, uh, it, it's really extensive. It's it's a great 
tool. It's pretty much though the only tool. So I, I, it's great because I don't have a better answer because I don't think there's another one out there. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it. there's the APC specific tool. And I think other vendors have a specific tool for their um, you know, devices. I think it's better to have something like not anyway, because what if you use like me, APC, but then later on you switch to something else then you'd probably have to switch your solution over as well and reconfigure all your servers and things. But having something, I don't know much about NUT, but um, I'm assuming, you know, based on what you said, you could just continue using that and uh, not have to change as much as you'd have to change if you went from one vendor to another. Right. And that, that's very true. You Then you would just change the NUT server and the thing it does to talk to all the other servers can remain the same. So you can swap out vendors without too much pain. So that is yep. another, that's probably a good point of uh, having an advantage of running it. I, I believe Tim's got one about running it on a Pi because you can make the Pi the NUT server. So it's because Pi's, um, by the way, putting a UPS on a Pi, actually pretty easy. You just take a yep. US because they're powered over USB. You just go grab one of those battery banks. You can have a pie last for days. <laughs> and You really uh, can too. You have to watch those because a lot of those don't have the correct voltage, the, the correct uh, amps when it comes to the output. But as long as you have that taken care of, I, yeah. I totally agree. I would go a step further and say, if you have access to a Raspberry Pi, I, I, I'm too scared to look at the prices and availability right now. Oh, that's true too. But um, if you do have access to one, I like to run a utility server, which is this is how I do it. My utility server has Nagios on there, Smoke Ping. It used to run my Unify controller. Not anymore, though. Um, that's a little complicated to get Unify working on a Raspberry Pi. You absolutely can do it. There's update issues I won't get into. But for the most part, the idea is you're monitoring um, softwares and solutions and things you can have on this Pi. You can image the SD card really easily. So... Um, if something goes wrong, you could just re-image it and everything's back to normal. And um, that's a good way to do it as well. I still recommend something watching the watcher, but um, I, I think there's something to be said of having a utility server. And then at that point, running something like NUT on that server would actually be a, a good fit. And you can just have that be the thing that monitors all the things. Absolutely. Well, I think we've hopefully educated people on some of the options out there, maybe narrowed it down for some, or maybe expanded the options for others and gave you some more choices and more projects to play with. <laughs> There's <laughs> figure which end of the spectrum you want to start with. I won't lie between net data and up Kumo, the ones we mentioned, those two are just going to be the dead, simple, easy to uh, get going yep. and set up ones. So go Absolutely. ahead and check those ones out. And if you are feeling a little bit confident after getting those up and running, dive into Zavix or Nagios or any one of the other ones you talk about, or even, you know, the Grafana and, and fun that is with Grafana and setting the complexities of that up. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. All right. See you guys later.